guys remember Computer Reset, right? The giant warehouse of old computers in Dallas that was like an archaeological dig? Well, um, ever since it closed to the public, things have changed a lot. Um, there's been a group of volunteers working over the last year to remove trash and reorganize a place so you can actually walk through it now without worry of dying in an avalanche of heavy, sharp steel objects. Oh, and they replace all the lights now, so you no longer need to bring a flashlight with you just to see where you're going. Of course, this place is clear on the opposite side of Dallas for me, which is a one hour drive just to get there, and then another hour to get home. Needless to say, I don't make the trip over there unless I have a good reason. Anyway, one of the volunteers called me a few weeks ago and said they'd found something I might be interested in doing a video on, and apparently there are five of them in these boxes they found in the back room. And so I agreed, and um, they loaded it right up into my car for me. <laughs> And now that I've got it home in my garage, let's take it out and have a look. So what we have here is an IBM 7496 Executive Workstation. It's apparently quite rare. If you Google for that, you won't find anything at all, except maybe this video. But at the time I'm making this video, as you can see, there's just nothing to be found. So let's see what we can find out about this thing. Let's open the keyboard. Well, you can tell this has been in the box for a very long time. Well, it appears to be a standard IBM Model M keyboard, manufactured in 1988. And uh, we'll just plug the cable in here. It looks like if you want to access the port, you have to open this door. Now, one thing I want to show you is that you can stick your finger right through here, so I think that's where they want you to run the cables. I'd also like to point out that the monitor, while integrated onto the case, actually plugs into the back like a regular monitor. Plugging in the power cable turned out to be more difficult than I thought. Uh, no matter what angle I tried, I struggled to get it to fit. I suspect it was designed with a right angle plug in mind, however, I don't have one of those handy. Anyway, I eventually got one in there. And of course, to power it on, we have to find the power switch. Uh, this certainly could be the switch to power on the whole system, but um, there's this front cover here that's locked and I can't see what's in there. I went back to the original box and found the key was taped to the top piece of foam. And uh, let's see if that works, and it does. But the only thing behind the door is a floppy drive. Incidentally, I've never seen a cardboard transport protector for a 3.5 inch floppy drive before. Very neat. Okay, so I'm ready to power this thing on. Uh, it's possible it's been sitting in that box in excess of 30 years, so you know who knows what will happen. Well, I hear the fan running. And we did get a post beep, so that's promising. You might be tempted to say the monitor isn't working, but uh, watch what happens when I power it off. That effect suggests the monitor part is working fine. So I guess the next step is to take it apart. Uh, maybe there'll be something I can repair. Every screw in this system is one of those annoying flat tip screws. I'd like to know who thought these were a good idea. Well, the bottom comes off easily enough, but there's this three prong connector going to the monitor, most likely for the switch and for powering the monitor itself. Looking at the board, it reminds me a lot of a PS2 Model 30 or something like that. There are some interesting oddities, like this sticker over the top of the ISA slot saying, do not use this slot. I suspect it's because there's only two slots on the rear of the case, so no opening for the third card. I want to get a look at the rest of the board, so I'm going to remove the power supply. And it looks like a standard IBM AT power connector there. And next, I'll remove the drive bracket here. Some interesting things of note, it appears to have possibly an IDE connector, but there's no room to mount a hard drive. Perhaps they plan to ship it with either a hard drive or a floppy, but not both? Anyway, the CPU is an Intel 8086, and there is an empty socket for a floating point unit next to it. I see 64K of video RAM, and being it has a VGA port on the back, that means it probably uses MCGA video, which was more or less unique to the IBM PS2 models 25 and 30, or at least so we thought. Uh, of course, that makes sense, being the Model 30 came out in 1987, which appears to be the same year this system was manufactured. Ideally, I'd like to power this thing on and try with a regular monitor, but there's no power switch anywhere to be found. So it looks like I need to figure out how this cable works. Uh, one thing I immediately notice is that when I put my meter in continuity mode on pins 1 and 3, and then flick the power switch, you can see that it's a direct short. So I think this is how the switch passes power to the power supply. So here's my plan. I'm going to bend up this paper clip and make a jumper to take the place of the switch. So I'll just poke that in there like so. Right, so I got the power cord hooked up, but I'm actually going to flip the power on the power strip and we'll see if it blows up. Yeah, that's not good. 
OK, that's probably not good. Uh, this caused the lights in the room to flicker, and I could actually see a spark inside the power supply. I'll show you again in slow motion. If you look right in this area, uh, you'll see a flash coming not only from the paper clip in the connector, but from the bottom of the power supply. So I guess that didn't work, so I'll take that out. And I guess I'll connect it back to the monitor and see if it still works, at least as well as it did before. So here goes. Dead as a door now. Alright, so now I'm going to have to take the power supply back out, take it apart, and see if there's hopefully a fuse in there that blew, because uh, hopefully that's all it was. Oh, you've got to be kidding me! The power supply uses some security screws, which I don't have the tool for at the moment, and rather than order one and wait several days, I'm going to do the next best thing. Now, I'm not going to chop the screws off, but I'm going to chop the sides of the head off so that it's more square. So, like this, I should be able to use some pliers and rotate it some. And there we go. One down and three more to go. So, I got the cover off, and I see the fuse. That thing's in there tight. Let me pry that out of there. It sort of looks blown, but I can't tell for sure, so I'll test it with my meter. And yep, it's blown. Uh, by the way, while we're inside of this thing, check out this fan. I've never seen one like this in a computer power supply. Anyway, I took a trip to the hardware store to see if I could find a replacement fuse, and sure enough, I think this is an exact match. Good. You know, it's stuff like this that makes these projects take forever. I mean, I've already wasted basically a whole day on this power supply problem. Oh, and by the way, when I go to put this thing back together, I will not be using those horrendous screws. Instead, I'll just use regular screws as the threading is standard. That way, if me or anyone else needs to get back inside in the future, it won't be such a pain. Okay, so here we go again. I'm going to try to power this thing up. Here's that mysterious cable I don't understand the wiring on, obviously. And guess what? It's still dead. I spent the next two days troubleshooting the power supply, trying to figure out what else was burned out, and simply couldn't figure it out. Needless to say, there's no chance of finding a service manual for this thing, because the almighty Google doesn't even seem to be aware that the machine even exists. But even if it did, the service manual would probably say to replace the power supply as one whole unit. So the likelihood of fixing this computer is looking more and more bleak. Uh, it was already broke, and um, I seem to have made it even worse. So a couple weeks later, I went back to Computer Reset, and the volunteers were kind enough to let me test out the other machines they had there. These were all sealed in their boxes, so the question is, did they arrive at Computer Reset in working condition and have just failed due to age, or did they wind up here in the first place because they were defective? <laughs> Powering these on may help provide that answer. David here, uh, yep, he has the same name as me, was kind enough to pull these out and check them. So here goes the second one. And well, it does pretty much the same thing the first one did. The screen comes on, and in this dark environment you can even see the raster, but uh, no video. So here comes unit number three, and uh, it too did the exact same thing. I'm starting to see a pattern here. So on to unit number four. Oh, what the heck. It appears the roof had leaked during last night's rainstorm and soaked this box. Well, it's, it's dry. Probably powered on. See if we can test it. Okay, so uh, here goes unit number four. Oh hey, my gosh. Picture. The one box that had water damage actually has a system that posts. Unfortunately, upon closer inspection, the video is garbled. It looks like bad video RAM, but uh, at least this gives me something to go on. Uh, so this is the most promising unit so far, but uh, we thought we'd go ahead and pull the last one out just to be sure. Uh, this one actually looks just a bit different. I noticed the monitor is of a different style. Our theory is that this one has a color monitor and the other ones were monochrome. It has a PS2 look to it for sure. Unfortunately, as you can see, it has the same problem the rest of them have. Uh, no video and no post beeps. On the bright side, it did have the manual, which I'm going to take with me. It might be handy. Okay, so we have the partially working unit back at home, and I guess it's time to see if I can make any progress with it. I tried to see if it would boot any sort of DOS, but it doesn't. I just get this screen. And by the way, I've seen this screen before on a properly working IBM. And while similar, I think this workstation is uh, just a bit different animation. Interestingly, it will boot to basic in ROM, and um, I can play around a bit. There are actually two issues I can see. First, I noticed that any character starting with the lowercase p and after is corrupt. So looking at an ASCII chart, this basically means that everything highlighted here will display correctly. Anything past that is corrupt. Now, this would make a lot more sense of being a RAM chip or a broken trace or something if the corruption started one line further down, because that would split it right down the middle, indicating a problem with bit 7. 
But since it's not like that, it makes no sense at all. I suspect it could be a problem with the video generation chip or the character ROM. But there's a second problem that's even more perplexing. Every other row of text on the screen is shifted over by what appears to be 16 characters to the right. I was hoping I could get this thing to boot to a DOS disk, and then maybe I could try something in graphics mode, and that would tell me if it was a character ROM problem or not. Ok, so time to disassemble this one. And by the way, I had tried booting this from a floppy disk but had no luck. Um, I think there's a problem with the disk drive. So I removed the drive and swapped it with the drive in the other system. Now, these appear to be the same drive mechanisms that were used in IBM PS2 systems. I tried a 720K MS-DOS disk and after pressing F1 it does attempt to read the disk but ultimately doesn't boot from it. Um, I took one of the drives apart to see if they were gummed up or had broken belts but I couldn't find anything wrong. Um, then I thought I'd try an XTIDE card to see if maybe I could boot from that. However, not surprisingly, it didn't work. The PS2 line of the same era uh, are known for having a BIOS that doesn't support option ROMs on expansion cards. I took it over to my friend Kevin's house. Uh, he makes and sells these little adapters that allow you to use a standard floppy drive in a PS2 style system. So I thought maybe we could try one of those. And it fits in there just fine. Much like before, the light comes on and the drive spins, but it doesn't seem to want to boot. So just for the heck of it, Kevin uh, took a known working drive from an IBM PS2 and put it in there. It uh, fits perfectly by the way, but still didn't work. We also tried swapping the RAM modules. Not that we expected this to work, but uh, people would ask about it if we didn't at least try. I also tried swapping the BIOS ROM chips from the other machine, but it made no change in behavior. And we thought about desoldering and swapping out the 64K video RAM here, but uh, we were both convinced by this point that the video RAM probably wasn't the culprit. And well guys, we've come to the end of the road. I I've been working on this for a week now and it's just time to move on. But there's something I want to point out about these computers. Uh, these could possibly be prototypes and there are three reasons why I think that's possible. First of all is what I've mentioned before, there's just sheer lack of any documentation to be found on Google anywhere. Um, the second reason is because I cannot find any serial numbers on these machines anywhere. On the inside, on the outside, on the back, on the bottom, they, just, they don't have any. Uh, the third reason is because some of the parts in here have handwritten part numbers on them. Uh, like this floppy drive uh, cable connector here for example. That's something you typically don't see on a mass produced product from IBM. So it is unfortunate that I was not able to get one to work, but I think they are more or less identical in function to something like an IBM PS2 Model 30. Um, so, you know, you could use that as a reference to see what they might be like if they were working, because those are well-known computers. And if these are prototypes, then there's still the mystery of how they wound up at Computer Reset. And the question is, did they show up there 30 years ago in working condition and they just deteriorated from age? Or were they broken when they showed up there in the first place? I will say that all of the systems that we took out of the box look essentially brand new. I mean, there's no signs of wear, there's no signs of usage, there's no, you know, scuff marks, there's no dents, there's no, um, <laughs> no uh, dirty things, dirty fingerprints, or anything like that on them. So again, big mystery there. And we may never know the story behind them, but I hope you've at least enjoyed having a look at this piece of forgotten computing history. I have told the volunteers at Computer Reset that if they find anything else interesting to go ahead and give me a call and maybe I'll do a review on that as well. Um, but that's it for the moment, so um, stick around for the next episode and thanks for watching.